This is AP Calculus, section 7.2, and now we're going to get into volumes. We've been dealing with area and the integration. When we've been taking definite integrals, we've been finding area under the curve. Now what we're going to do is also find volumes. Before you do that, though, I want you to warm up with this problem and try to find the area bounded by these three curves. Pause and go ahead and do that. So here's the setup that we're going to have. Uh, this point right here is going to be my A. This point here is going to be my B. I need to find those points of intersection, so you need to do that on your calculator. This point right here becomes a little bit more obvious where it's 1. Now if you notice, if I draw my rectangle, my top minus bottom will change as from there compared to, I don't know if this marker will change, no, over to there top minus bottom changes. So at this one, I have to split this integral into two different pieces. So I'm gonna go from A to one, and then one to B. You can definitely write this like this, and then go ahead and find the answer, and I believe that it's uh, like 2.35, something like that. But make sure that if you set this up and write A's and B's, you have to tell me what A and B are. And I believe that this is 0.739, negative and B is one point, uh, I forget what it is, let me look, 1.786. And if you find that integral, I did something tricky on the calculator, you don't have to be able to, you don't have to know how to do this, but storing the values into A and B, are, it's very nice because then you don't have to carry all these decimal places. If you only do it to three decimal places and plug and chug, you're gonna get some errors. So carrying as many decimal places as possible is great. So here's my A and B. What I did then with the equations is that I did a Boolean operator. You don't have to know how to do this, but it's kind of nice to see. So I turn on Y1 minus Y2 for X less than or equal to one. And then I turn on Y1 minus Y3 for X greater than or equal to one. I put the equals in there, I should leave one of them out. Uh, regardless, it doesn't matter, but I, it, it worked for me, so I left them in. And so what I can do then is if I look at the graph, there's my graph, and then there's that x equal to one, that's the shift. And so I'm going to go second calc, and I can do my number seven, and then my lower limit is gonna be alpha a. I got that stored in, nice. And then I can do alpha b, I got that stored in, and then that will find my answer for me, 2.354. So that's what you should be ending up with. So this is equal to 2.354. Three decimal places you can truncate or round, no problem. All right, getting into the volumes. And with the volumes, what we need is just a basic talk about volumes. I have something that's called a loaf of bread. Uh, if you look at a cylinder, my drawing on here isn't great, but there's a cylinder. If you ever want to find the volume of the cylinder, many of you know this to be the base area times the height. So B is the base area. As long as it's a cylinder or a right prism, as long as the bases are the same, you can just do base area times height. And what that comes out to be, and what I like to look at it as, is what I call the loaf of bread principle. Loaf of bread principle means that I have two end pieces that are identical, just like a loaf of bread, and then I have all the slices. So if I find the area of one of these end pieces, which I call the crust, some people call the heel and other names, if I find the area of that, I can just multiply it by each one of these slices, and that would give me my volume. And so this is two dimensions area, and this is my third dimension, which is the height. Now that works for, like I said, any kind of prism, you can do it for a loaf of bread. Let me see how I can draw this. There's my loaf of bread. There I go. Same thing, here's my base, there's all my slices that go back, and so my volume is equal to the base area times the height. Now what we'll be dealing with today though is that this shape won't be regular. It will change according to a curve. 
And so when we do that, we're going to have to adjust, and it's going to be equation-based rather than strictly number-based. Um, you can check out some of these demos on this site. Uh, you can just click on this link or I'll search for some of this stuff. This will tell us how to, or give you pictures of what we're going to be doing today. What I have is, I do have a picture here that's going to show us. So what we're going to do now is we're going to actually find the volume. And the volume is going to be created by taking a curve and rotating around an axis. It's called the axis of rotation. And so in this case, we're going to take this curve. This should touch these points down here. I don't know why it's not. But this thing is going to, this red curve is going to swing around and whip around. And we're going to keep on whipping around this x-axis. When that happens, we're going to get a solid. That solid can look like a football or a kiwi fruit, whatever you want to say. Now, here's my Riemann sums rectangles, and we're going to take this, and what I want to do is call one of these a cut. And this is the cut that I'm looking at in particular. And we're going to take this one, and we're going to rotate it around. So it's kind of coming out at us. And so if I do this, I can find the volume and six subdivisions this looks good and watch this now this is fun oh it went fast i need to slow it down okay so if i double click on this now notice this is coming out at us and this this looks really kind of good i can do more and more divisions more and more cuts if i want to make it a better estimate and then there it is if you look at that that's going around so hopefully you can get the perspective that that's coming out at us, yeah? So I take this curve and I rotate around. I get these curves. Now, these spaces I don't like. So what are we gonna do to get this to be uh, more accurate? Well, it's the same thing as what we did with the area. We're gonna let this delta x of each one of these cuts get smaller and smaller. As x goes to, uh, delta x goes to zero, then we're going to get the definite integral going. So if I do this, you can see what this will look like. I use Simpson's rule here. And there it goes. And there's my kiwi fruit. Oh, so nice. So that's the idea. We're rotating around, and we're going to get a three-dimensional figure, and we want to find the volume. The volume is going to be created by taking each one of those cuts, which creates a disk. It's a circle that has a little height. That's why we started the discussion with uh, cylinders at the very beginning. Okay, so let me see now. So if you look at your notes now, here's what happens, the disk method. Find the volume of the disk method, we can use one of these things. So we're taking this cut, we're revolving around, it's going to be a circle that has some height. So if we take the volume of this and add up all of these disks that we can create under this curve, we're going to get the volume. And so how do you find that? Well, pi r squared gives me the area of this circle. If I multiply it by delta x, that's going to give me the height. As delta x goes to zero, and we do the limiting thing and all that kind of stuff, we end up with this dx here. So actually what we have is pi r squared times dx, which would be the area times a height. Overall, then that gives me volume. And remember that this integral is the great summing machine. We're gonna be adding up all of these disks, one right after another. And, um, if the cut is perpendicular to the axis of revolution, this would be like a horizontal axis of revolution, then we get a vertical cut. Here's a horizontal cut because the axis of revolution is vertical. Cuts always perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Now, if you look at some of the questions that I write here, why are we using the integral to find volume? Well, really what we're doing is we're just adding up a bunch of areas that are multiplied by a width. So this is two dimensions, this is a third dimension. Overall, three dimensions, and then I go from A to B. That would give you your volume. And more specifically here, 
we go a to b, and in this case it's going to be pi r squared dx. This r now, though, is not a number. Most likely, well, it might be a number, but most likely it'll be some sort of function that we're dealing with. Yeah? So there we go. Get into some examples. So this happens to be the same thing as that picture that I just had from autograph. That's this thing right here. This graph is the square root of the sine of the x. So if I delete this, this is just the square root of sine of x. And so what I do now is I figure out uh, what this thing's going to look like. If I graph it, there's kind of a crude graph, and then I want to, my different colors aren't showing up, oh there it is, good. That would be a particular cut that I'm going to be revolving around and coming out at us, out from there. And so that's going to form a disk when I revolve it around. This would be equivalent to the radius, and it does go all the way around. So when I rotate this curve all the way around, it creates both sides of the circle. Some students think, is it one half pi r squared or just pi r squared? Yeah, it's pi r squared because we're revolving it all the way around. And then this height here would be our r. And if we look at that, r in this case is going to be the height. It's going to change everywhere along this curve. So here I'm going to have a small one, small one, bigger one, and so on. And it changes based upon this equation. So my radius is going to go as the square root of sine of x goes. That's my radius. So if I set up my integral, the volume is equal to, I'm starting at 0, I'm going up to pi, and then I need pi r squared. So I got pi r squared. We said that we had square root of sine of x, and I have to square it. So here's pi r squared dx. And so here's the area portion, and then here's the third dimension, which gives me my volume. This is the great summing machine, which will add up all of these disks over and over again with a thickness that goes to 0. And I should be consistent with the notation. That should be a capital R. That's how you go ahead and find that. And if you do this out, you should get 2 pi for your answer. You should try that. Make sure you do. Uh, example two, if I try to find the volume of a solid when the region bounded by this parabola and this line is rotated about y equal to 1, we definitely need a picture here. So let's try this. 1, 2, it's a parabola that's shifted down. And then I'm going to have a horizontal axis of rotation. A good idea is to draw a little circly arrow that didn't show up that well but to signify that this is my axis of rotation. So the region bounded by this is in here, and that's what I'm going to be rotating around. So when I draw my cut, sorry, this is getting pretty small, but there's my cut right there. How do I find that radius of that cut? Well, it's going to be, well, how do we find the height of any one of these things? Well, it's just going to be the top minus the bottom. So my radius is going to be negative 1 minus my lower, which would be my parabola, which would be x squared minus 2. Be careful with these minuses and make sure you sort this out properly. You should get negative x squared and then it's actually plus 1. That's going to be my radius. And then my points of integration that I'm integrating from, these cuts will run from this point to this point. Well, since it's a regular parabola, I go left one, up one. So this is going to be from negative 1 to 1, pi r squared. Pi can go inside or outside because it's a constant. And then my radius I already have here, negative x squared plus 1 dx. Pi r squared. Oh, I forgot the squared. So always go back and double check pi r squared times your dx. This would be the integral. Most of the things that I'm setting up right now, I'll just set up the integrals. I'm going to trust that you can go ahead and find the definite integrals. Homework, same thing. Do a couple of them out by hand and then use the rest of them by your calculator. Practice with your calculator or also practice um, with, use Wolfram, whatever you want to do. Uh, now, if we get into y equal to 0, we're going to get a little bit different situation here. And I'm going to try to draw this a little bit better.